Because here at Black Mesa, we know that a productive workplace is a happy workplace. That's why we've worked frivolously on the latest groundbreaking technology to give our talented workers the edge they need to excel, such as eyes, hands, and fingertips. Thanks to these revolutionary advancements and enhancements, our workers can see farther, work longer, and perform better than ever before. Just ask Joe! Forklift go out! Forklift go out! Ha <laughs> he cracks Forklift me up! Go. And in the event of a workplace injury, our patent-pending Black Mesa Medical Station will be there to get you back into action. Thanks to its locally grown, environmentally sustainable, and ethically harvested green first aid fluids, you can expect to be fixed up in no time, hands-free with its hydraulic arm connecting directly into the user's hazardous environmental suit using recently developed AI technology. Go ahead, Keep give it a try! Oh uh, my goodness! Why wasn't he wearing his suit? Somebody please page the administrator! No, please don't tell Dr. Green, Green. I can't be fired Did for we this. learn nothing from the wall taser? That wall taser was a suit charger, you Jerry! Dumbass. Do you hear me, Jerry? Don't go to the light! It's probably not up to code! When it comes to the video game industry, cancelled projects and missed opportunities are nothing new. And if you were to ask me what video game series encapsulates that the most, I would not hesitate to bring up Half-Life. From as early as 1999, publisher Sierra Entertainment greenlit a port of Half-Life to the Sega Dreamcast that would be cancelled not once, but twice. The project was originally assigned to Pyrotechnics, a studio purchased by Sierra back in 1997 who worked on Return to Krondor and Tanneris. This port would have ended up being their final project because the studio was taken off the project three days later and never made another game since. And the responsibility of consolizing one of FPS's greatest would fall into the hands of Captivation Digital Laboratories, leading to an announcement on February 14th of 2000 at the Malia Trade Show in Cannes, France. Now that Opposing Force had been released, Gearbox was later brought on to create the infamous HD expansion pack, as well as an exclusive campaign expansion for the console, which later became Blue Shift. The HD pack that would have released with this port were earlier versions of what we got on Steam, so if you already didn't like those models, you'll probably like these ones a little less. Then, just two months after it was announced, Sierra approved and began concurrent production on a port of Half-Life for the PlayStation 2. Valve was not particularly involved in these projects, likely because their sequel, Half-Life 2, had been in pre-production for a year up to this point, so the publisher was probably a little eager to franchise the IP. I've already talked about Blue Shift on the channel, so you're probably aware that the Dreamcast port was doomed from the start. Copies were sent out to various publications for review, and, as you would expect, it underperformed. Chandra Renaire on the UK Dreamcast magazine in issue 15 specifically cited poor performance, low, inconsistent frame rates, and general dissatisfaction with the lack of online functionality. I understand all of those other points, but it was also a pre-release version. I don't know why they would expect it to have online functionality already, but this was also 22 years ago, so maybe Maybe expectations were a little different back then. Sadly, the frame rate is amongst the worst we've ever seen. Half-life, half-finished more like. Damn Chandra, you tell him. The frame rate fluctuated between 60 and 20 frames per second, occasionally dropping into the single digits. Loading times between maps were notable, and because the port lacked an autosave feature, if you died in a map that you hadn't saved in, your load times between deaths would be even longer. Now to Chandra's credit, online features were planned through SegaNet as an expansion. Report on by Tom Bramwell from Eurogamer in September 2000, a second disc was in the works that contained Gold Source multiplayer games, games like the original Counter-Strike and TF Classic, as well as Half-Life Deathmatch and Opposing Forces Capture the Flag. Opposing Forces campaign was speculated to be part of the disc as well, but never confirmed. This was told to Eurogamer right after the port's first major delay. It was delayed numerous times, from its original release date in summer 2000 down to September 2000, later to November. November 2000, which at the same time the PS2 port was announced to the public, to its final release date of June 2001, to eventually being announced on a public forum that the port was being scrapped altogether. But PS2 fans were feeling pretty good. During that announcement back in November, Sierra promised a co-op experience exclusive for the PS2 port, as well as four player split screen deathmatch. You might have noticed that little hyperlink at the bottom there that says screenshots. Uh, I tried to click it, but it brought me to a dead link. I guess that's on me for trying to cite 
articles that are literally over two decades old. The degree of cooperative play was not elaborated on until the show at E3 the following year, where it wasn't the single player campaign retrofitted to work with two players, but another original campaign, once again worked on by Gearbox, though no online play was planned for this port at all. Randy Pitchford claims in an interview with 3D Action Planet that the development kits for online connectivity just weren't available for that time. I don't know if that's entirely correct, but I believe him when he says that he couldn't get his hands on one. They claimed that the Dreamcast port had to be cancelled because of changing market conditions. Sega's Dreamcast, much like their port made for it, was just not doing too great. And it made more financial sense to cancel the game altogether than to send it to print and get underwhelming sales. Publications like IGN claimed that they weren't too surprised by this. The release date for the Dreamcast port wasn't present on a lot of online retailers after its final delay. There were other games whose Dreamcast ports were cancelled around the same time, but this is a unique case. Unlike Capcom vs. SNK2 or Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver 2, Half-Life for the Dreamcast was practically finished, the Prima strategy guide was printed and ready to ship, whereas those ports were cancelled fairly early on. That might not be the best example. SNK vs. Capcom 2 was released in Japan on the Dreamcast, it was the international releases that were cancelled, but you get what I mean. Captivation's work was moved from the Dreamcast over to the PlayStation 2, where Gearbox took up the reins and made small tweaks and improvements to the campaign, turning the PS2 port into a larger collaborative project between the two companies, including the single player beyond what Gearbox was originally contracted to work on. Captivation wouldn't be credited on the box for the game, but would still be listed under special thanks in the credits. And now, all Half-Life fans' eyes were on the PS2 port. The HD pack that Gearbox had created would be enhanced to a degree that we never saw on PC. Additional geometry and simple skeletal animations were added to retinal scanners and charging stations to give the appearance of moving parts and mechanisms. You can see all that green juice leaving the container and being stabbed into you with a needle that follows your position. NPCs were given individually animated fingers as well as full facial animations with moving eyes that could also track the player's movements. Harry S. Robbins, who voiced some of the Half-Life 1 scientists, even had some outtakes referencing these two new additions. Definitely. I mean, look at me. I can even point now. I'm sorry, I had my eyes closed. These new eyelids are amazing. While we're on the topic, he also had a really hard time saying Gordon. Ah, Gorman, there you are. Darn it, let's do it again. Good morning, Gorman. Crap. Nobody tell Gabe, okay? I'm afraid we'll be deviating a bit from the standard analysis procedures today, Gorman. What? It's Gordon. Jeez, can't even get the hero's name right. If there are mistakes, Me too, have I <laughs> don't make them. Want to share a beer with this man? Oh, wait, right, that's a Barney's thing. And then, it actually came out. The only difference here is how wrong things can go. The epic thriller that combines non-stop action and excitement. Half-Life, featuring advanced graphics, unparalleled AI, and the exclusive new co-op multiplayer game, DK. Ah yes, my favorite Half-Life game, DK, Donkey Kong. He's finally here, cascading for you. All right, let's take a look at the manual because I forgot to look at the PC version's manual in the first Half-Life video. Part of this is gonna be playing catch up in that regard, so I won't just be going over the Gearbox editions. Deep in the bowels of a decommissioned missile base known as the Black Mesa Research Facility. Okay, so the military ties were there from the very beginning. I really should have known. I'm actually not reading the rest of the paragraph, I just wanted to address that one line. Page 7 shows us the letter that Gordon received from Black Mesa regarding his employment, and this is some great flavor text for the adventure. Black Mesa was given a letter of recommendation from Gordon's former MIT professor Dr. Kleiner, who also happens to be working at Black Mesa. And this letter of employment was only given to Gordon about 11 days before the Black Mesa incident takes place, and I believe it's safe to assume that Gordon didn't move there on the same day, because the man was studying at the Institute of Experimental Physics in Innsbruck, Austria. He is, however, urged to move to the facility as soon as possible to begin his HEV suit training. Yeah, this letter confirms that Black Mesa employees, or at least employees who aren't married and have dependents, live on site in their own dormitories, which makes perfect sense. I always assumed that this plot point didn't make it into canon until Half-Life 2 Episode 2. We can actually see Gordon's dormitories in the exclusive new multiplayer DK, though it's not too spectacular. Innsbruck, 
Austria was chosen specifically as a reference to the Innsbruck experiment on December 15th, 1997, an experiment that demonstrated the transferring of characteristics of photons or other quantum scale particles to another, regardless of their distance. Teleportation, they called it, which as you know is a massive theme in Half-Life. It's not exactly teleportation as we would expect. It's closer to just two entangled photons who mirror each other's actions and attributes in real time. Imagine if I had a Rubik's Cube and you had an identical Rubik's Cube that was made at the exact same time, and any adjustments that I made to it were also made to yours. That's not the best example, but it's the best I can think of right now. This was used practically as recently as 2017 aboard the satellite Mesius, a quantum-enabled Chinese satellite, though it wasn't used for information or anything that we would think is teleportation, instead being worked into a form of digital security. They believe that if it were to be compromised or tampered with in any way, then the particle aboard the satellite would be affected in a way that would practically be announcing that it had been tampered with. Fans of Half-Life who have never read this letter to Gordon may also know the Innsbruck experiment from a track composed for Half-Life 2. They may also recognize the name Dr. Kleiner, but we'll get to that eventually. Gearbox applied this letter to Gordon as a basis for their extended Half-Life universe in their own little way on the following page. A hazard course training schedule expands on this original concept, implying that it's more than just a simple obstacle course to wear the HEV suit in, with it being used for anomalous materials handling training, anti-mass spectrometer overload simulations, security training, and indicating whether their instructor is present in person or there via hologram. One of these instructors is Dr. Kleiner himself, though if the blue shift hazard course is any indication from that game, it could very well be just the hazard course we've experienced before. Black Mesa is that inept. Though now that I think about it, maybe that hazard course was added as a last minute addition. All you'd really need to do is just have Mike Shapiro redub the lines as the Barney, so maybe that's what happened. I can really only guess. We recognize a few names here, Barney Calhoun, Gordon Freeman, and Gina Cross. She's the hologram hazard course lady from Gordon's time here. I'm not sure if she was given a name by Valve until now. But there are some names on here that are a little more obscure, such as Otis Lorre, who isn't a specific Otis model that we've seen before, and Walter Bennett. We've actually met Walter since we've played Blue Shift, and his existence in that game slipped entirely under my radar until now. Excellent, Walter. Finish aligning the power cell matrix and I'll see if I can get the system online in the main room. This man was a nod to Walter's world, a section of Planet Half-Life where a glasses model scientist acted as their mascot, answering questions written in character. If you've ever wondered why the glasses model in Sven Co-op is called Walter, or why basically anyone who played Half-Life as a kid refers to them as such, this is why. I'm not exactly qualified to talk on this because I didn't really live through this, and the appeal of Walter's world really came from the emotional attachment people had to it. But if you want to know more about it, Marfi Black's got a whole video talking about it, go check that out. Out. On another tangent within a tangent, Sierra's Q lead at the time, Mark Nagel, stated in an interview with PlayStation Magazine issue 57 in June 2002, almost a year after launch, that this port for PS2 would eventually receive mod support. This never happened. It wasn't until the community reverse engineered the PS2 port's co-op campaign into a PC release that a hidden button combination was discovered in the game's files. To grossly paraphrase, this code allows you to play Half-Life Uplink, the PC game's post-launch demo from 1999, but to word it that simply would be misleading. The files for Uplink were not available on Half-Life PS2's disc, but it was available on a copy of PlayStation Underground's Jam Pack demo disc, the very same demo disc that came with that issue of PlayStation Magazine. But even if you only had this demo disc, you still couldn't access Uplink. Only by entering this button combination in the cheats menu for Half-Life would you be given the choice to swap discs from there, and if you had that demo disc, you could then start the elusive demo. If this feature were finished, I would assume that the mod support that they promised would have been implemented in a similar manner. Not as fan-made mods made dedicated for the PS2 port, but as PC mods ported by Gearbox that were printed to a separate disc that would then be swapped in on this menu. It seems pretty likely that they wanted to bring over the mod USS Darkstar. It's one that the Gearbox team was pretty fond of, and Robbins even quoted a line from the mod as a nod to it. But that's the closest it got, and it was just for fun, it wasn't actually because they were porting the mod over. Gordon, I'm very concerned about these electrical force field barriers. What will happen if we have a power outage? Have you ever played USS Dark Star? I've heard of it before, but I never got around to trying it until I started this video. Sorry, I'm on duty, Mr. Freeman. 
Hey, if you're getting paid to lay around, then have at it, my dude. Get that space bread. I wonder what Mark is working on these days. Oh, <gasps> Starbucks. All right, what was I talking about? I got lost. Right, security clearances. That's very important. Otis's training and public relations had to be canceled, to put it lightly. The resonance cascade happened on May 16th, so these just never happened. Meanwhile, one of the stars of Decay, Gina Cross, is testing out the HEV Mark Vibes, which Gordon would get to test drive in his next adventure, though I'm sure that that's a coincidence in terms of writing. It's unclear whether Gina is wearing one of the Mark Vibes in the Half-Life Decay campaign. If she is, then it is functionally identical to the Mark IV in just about every way except for having a microphone and a speaker to let her communicate with bass. Test. Testing. I'm going to assume that this is exclusive to the Mark V because this does open up some plot holes. Like, why couldn't the Lambda team reach out to Gordon this way? This tangent of mine is also ignoring whether or not this would be canon to Half-Life 2's Mark V. It's important to know that Valve didn't consider anything from the Gearbox Extended Universe when writing their theoretical sequel. The only exception I could think of is the name Calhoun. But who knows, maybe that isn't even true because the first Half-Life game had security guards labeled Barney in the game's files, so it really just boils down to whoever came up with his last name first. His microphone is like a great texture. Oh my god, oh, it is. perfect. Oh wait, you're not supposed to see that yet. That's the next video. Finally, we see a memo from Black Mesa's upper management written to Colette Green, our second protagonist in Half-Life Decay. It provides some context for the bureaucratic process, or possibly lack thereof, that resulted in the resonance cascade. The anti-mass spectrometer was calibrated to work with sample EP-0021, but due to a recent discovery of sample GG3883, the purest sample we've seen yet, it was rushed to replace the previous sample and run through the same procedures rather than putting it through the proper prep work. The paper mentions running the GG sample through a last minute simulation, but assuming that this is a virtual simulation, then it probably got fucked up by the system crash that's mentioned at the beginning of Half-Life 1, or could have even been the reason for the crash. Great job, LMOTA. Those are the backwards initials of Half-Life Rider. Mark Laidlaw, who is in fact not Wallace Breen, because why would he be? He's just OTA, or Office of the Administrator, so LM may not be the administrator directly. That or this was good enough of a scapegoat for Valve to use to explain why the administrator in the sequel was a different person. When I first started this project, the original plan was to give you a small taste of the original game's PS2 campaign as an appetizer for the main focus of this project, the co-op campaign Half-Life Decay. But as I I researched more about this port and delved deeper into its history and development, I ended up just going off on a massive tangent that had enough material in it to turn this into its own project, and that's exactly what you're watching now. That might be disappointing to some of you, but to put it this way, if I stuck to that original plan, then you'd have to sit through about 40 minutes of talking about the PS2 port of this game, and that's not the kind of video I wanted that to be. But the moment I saw that there was a brand new prologue added to the beginning of the hazard course, and then the light slam on during the opening of the tram ride, I wanted to play through the whole goddamn thing and see what every little change I could find that Captivation taped onto this thing. But the game having an animated main menu with music is something that feels delightfully wrong to me. Like I feel like I downloaded this from a really janky website that somehow made the game better but is probably giving me a million viruses. But I want to address something that kind of annoyed me right off the bat. No matter how I configured my console and its video output, the user interface and HUD were always locked to a 4x3 ratio, while all 3D rendered graphics were locked to a 16x9 widescreen aspect ratio. This meant that if I set my widescreen to 4x3 full screen, the HUD and menus looked fine, but everything else was horizontally squished to about 3 fourths of its intended size. But if I set the console to widescreen, it was the opposite. The rendered 3D graphics looked fine. Of the two though, this is what I ended up going with because I figured that having a game that looks mostly normal was better than one that looked squished. But here's the thing, right? Even when set to widescreen, the game is still being rendered at 4x3. This is how many older consoles handled widescreen up until the Wii, I believe. The game would render a widescreen image at 3 quarters the horizontal size and then stretch it back out, causing the pixels to appear stretched, which is an amusing little novelty to recall. You can recreate this same effect in Microsoft Paint by squishing an image down and then stretching it. I specifically say Microsoft Paint because if you do this in, say, Photoshop, you have to make sure you're doing it on a raster layer and then you need to hit enter to confirm the transformation, it, it's easier in Microsoft Paint. I don't have a problem with any of this, I think that it's a really interesting piece of game.
gaming history. I remember the first game that I saw this demonstrated on was F-Zero GX back on the GameCube, though I think that that game did have proper widescreen if you had component cables, but I never did. I could have circumvented this by upscaling the game beyond its native 480i resolution. I did, however, disable texture filtering. That's my fault completely, I just forgot to turn it back on, but it did give me a chance to look at how the game renders the flashlight. The lighting in this port is a little bit wonky, I want to say that's because of PCSX2, but look at the larger but slower resolution of sectors that this thing illuminates. It's almost impressive that they were able to pull off the look of the flashlight normally with just some basic texture smoothing. So how different is Half-Life's campaign for the PS2 port from the original? Well, not very, actually. To my surprise, much of the game remained intact, so I'll let you know right now that if I don't bring up a moment from Half-Life's campaign during this segment, it's because there wasn't anything notable for me to talk about that was different from the original release. There may have been some things that I missed, but if I did, I didn't think it was significant enough for me to jot down notes for. Unless, of course, it's some major secret easter egg that I just completely glossed over and didn't find. Uh, that's a little different. There were also a couple of moments that mechanically were identical to the original Half-Life, but I had a unique enough experience here to mention something. Does that make sense? But unlike games like Deus Ex from 2000 that got ported to the PlayStation 2, I didn't notice many, if any, corners cut to reduce map size. There were a few differences made to loading zones, but these usually added to the maps rather than took away from them. The closest I've got to this is this extra barnacle catwalk walkway in Lambda Core, and this broom closet from Honor Rail. It's easy to assume that this was to cover up a loading zone, but when I went to record new footage from the PC version of this transition, I'd got stuck in the ground and had to reload my save because I softlocked myself. This could be the result of Gold Source games after years of Steam Pipe updates, but the fact that I can't say for sure does speak to the quality that Captivation held up to here. But to help you retain everything and keep this as coherent as possible, let me start this from the very beginning. The first and possibly most obvious change is the previously mentioned hazard course. Have you ever wanted to know what happened just before Gordon stepped onto that elevator before he begins his training? I doubt it, I didn't, but here it is, complete with brand new recorded lines and some gestures that take advantage of those new model features. Ah, good morning, Gordon. Welcome to the Black Mesa training facility. Things are in a state of commotion this morning, but the training facility software should be in working condition. Please listen carefully as there is a little paperwork to take care of before we get started. Oh, I see that you have already signed our legal disclaimer. I, Gordon Freeman, hereby agree to the following terms, blah blah blah, in any case of serious injury, dismemberment, toxic poisoning, burns, rashes, lesions, blah blah, etc, etc, hereby agree to waive all rights as an employee of the Black Mesa facility. Okay, very good. Was your line cut short, or was that part of his speech? The rest of the hazard course is nearly identical, with only minor cosmetic changes. The hazard suit, for example, emerges out of a glass jar on a fancy pedestal. The same goes for the long jump module, which has been given an interesting rework. Instead of entering a reverse crouch jump, it is now activated by tapping the jump button a second time while in the air. If it wasn't for Crowbar Collective's remake Black Mesa, which used an almost identical input for this, I'd dismiss this as a minor change, but this is actually pretty cool. The added prologue at the beginning of the hazard course was even adapted into the fan-made but now generally accepted to be part of the full game Black Mesa hazard course. So this is all starting to feel a lot less like a coincidence, in a good way. While we're on the subject, crouch jumping has also been simplified. To pull your legs up in the air, just hold down the jump button. You can still use the input manually by pressing both L shoulder buttons simultaneously, but I don't really see why you would want to do this. The only new dedicated tutorial here teaches teaches you about the new lock-on feature, which allows the user to do just that, lock your aim onto a target. Think of it like Metroid Prime 3's lock-on, but not nearly as generous, which I think is fair. It only keeps your horizontal aim while you're locked on, letting you aim freely up and down. But if you have a moving enemy, especially an airborne moving enemy, you'll still need to adjust your aim to compensate, hence my comparison to Prime 3's lock-on rather than the GameCube games. This makes player tactics like circle strafing, which is traditionally a lot more difficult with a controller, 
to have consistent aim with, a total breeze. Enemies like turrets, soldiers, controllers, and even Zen grunts in the right circumstances become relative pushovers. I could have simply ignored this feature, but I had another plan in mind. I decided that I'm gonna use the lock on as much as they probably intended and counter this by playing the game on difficult, comparable to PC's hard mode. Meaning that head crabs take two crowbar swings to kill, vortigons don't telegraph their vort beams as much, and assassins use cloaking technology. And just to address something real quick, I've said in my previous Half-Life videos that I think that hard mode is a little too unbalanced and not as fun to play as. Uh, I've come around on that. I now exclusively play these games on hard mode, basically. Turns out I was just too stubborn to use harder hitting weapons on smaller enemies. Changing how you approach combat made this way more enjoyable on hard mode. I, I actually recommend giving it a shot. I figured that playing through this on hard mode and using the lock-on mechanic for the PS2 version would be a good way to balance this port's unforgiving save system. Yeah, it's just as bad as I described on the Dreamcast port. I discovered this the hard way when I jumped into the anti-mass spectrometer at the beginning of the game for fun and was punished by having to restart from the very first tram segment at the beginning of the game. So remember to pause the game and quick save as much as you can on top of regular saving. Quick saving will only save to the PS2's RAM, so you can use this even if you don't have a memory card, but it will be lost if you power cycle the console. If you want to save to the memory card, you have to go into the game's menu from the pause menu and then save there. I also learned this the hard way. While we're on the subject of RAM, you can't move during this opening tram segment. I assume that this is so that the game can unload objects faster in order to save on memory by having Gordon at one end of the tram at all times. Or perhaps there's some kind of game tick difference in the PS2 version, and this was the best way to ensure that the player doesn't accidentally clip out of the car or something important desyncs. Believe it or not, I've done this and it happened on stream even, so I have video evidence. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? Do you know who ate all the donuts? I don't think so. Were they communicating? Was that a thing in the original? I haven't seen this before. I, I love this subtle new opening at the beginning of Office Complex. And when I say subtle, I mean very loud and explosive. It really takes your attention away from the streamlined route you take in the vents to turn the power off, which I think is fine, but appears a little bit lazy. I think that this is the most extreme example in the game in terms of cut corners. I even encountered some of the same bugs I did when recording my first Half-Life video. I received so many comments assuring me that they'd never seen bugs like this in their playthroughs, leading me to think that I had a cursed copy or something. But it's happening here as well, so maybe I'm just the cursed one. NPC pathing just in general felt a lot more blocky here, and I think that this is exclusive to this port. I know that NPCs would generally move in a sort of tank controls sort of way, turning and banking rather than just like walking left and right, but it feels a lot more obvious here, and this might have been done to save resources. Now, it's kind of how I feel when I see someone I know in public, but my social battery just isn't charged yet. I relate to this Coomer on a spiritual level. I've come to learn that my biggest growing pain when it comes to playing Half-Life with a controller has been climbing ladders, or specifically jumping onto them. See, if you're pressing the jump button or even holding it when you touch a ladder, you're ejected off. This usually isn't an issue for me with PC games because I'm not holding down space to jump higher. However, games like Mega Man and Mario have trained me to hold the jump button until I land, unless the situation states otherwise, and this I noticed had inadvertently translated to console FPS's for me. That death was so sad I didn't even get a body splat. Having this set of brackets around interactable items has really opened up my eyes to objects in the world that I would have never thought to use the interact key on. I would always destroy the glass on these blast doors and we've got hostiles. That just felt like common sense, right? But no, it turns out you can just press the interact button, automatically breaking the glass which makes the door close. I always assumed that you needed to use blunt force to get this going, but no, this has been here the entire time. I even had to go back and test this in the original PC release, and yeah, it's it's there! This is a thing! I had no idea! If there's one skill that didn't really translate over to controller for me too well, that would be air strafing. I've become so accustomed to using this skill to dive right into this pipe at the end of this tram segment. So much so that I actually completely forgot how you're supposed to do this normally. To be honest, it's almost a little bit humbling to remember how far I've come with playing this game. Hey Trav guy, did you know that you could get the revolver in black? Last pit.
I said, did you know that you can get- Looks like Gearbox finally fixed this poor thing, no longer looking like one of those clown guns where the tip of the barrel is wider than the base. You know, the same thing that Tim Drake used to kill the Joker that one time. The regular HD pack on PC sort of fixes this, but the rail on top still looked a little funky. The perspective here is still a little silly on the PS2 release, but this is the best we're gonna get for an official release. Want to see my favorite change made to this version? Fucking incredible. Gone are the days of needing to aim for medkits on this table to avoid fall damage or hoping to air strafe at the right time to end up in the rafters. That was all it took to fix this segment, a little bit of water. Just enough to break your fall and not endanger the player while still giving brand new players that oh shit moment. They even pile up some debris in the hallway afterwards to block it off from the gargantua arena so that power up remains mostly the same. This is amazing. I got yoinked off my cart by a barnacle and something just fucked up my collision enough for Gordon to get instantly gibbed, so that was pretty cool. What the fuck? Ah, the explosive knee technique, I should have known. This minor platforming puzzle here to get up to the control room to launch the satellite has been slightly tweaked, making it a lot easier to know what you're supposed to do by replacing one of the large metal boxes with a barrel that you know that you can easily jump onto. Except I think someone didn't quite get the idea of what this puzzle was supposed to make you do because you can just use the barrel to jump up from that to the door. Uh, to whoever did this, your heart was in the right place, but uh, <laughs> you just missed the point. The ichthyosaurs are still still goofy as shit with how they abruptly turn and play their wake-up sound underwater, something that I thought was a goofy bug in the modern Steam release, but no, it's it's also here too. This also means that you could still sit here over by the generators and just cheese them to death with the pistol and crossbow. <laughs> Is Gordon's neck okay after that? Get this man an HEV neck brace after that. God damn. Have you ever seen the kill state in questionable ethics before? Because I don't think I have. I know you're waiting for me behind that door, you big fucking nerd. My assumptions have led my babies to capitalism. Oh, capital. <laughs> I just say cannibalism. <laughs> my assumptions have led my children to cannibalism. Wait, he's over there? Remember in my first Half-Life video when the helicopter boss fight blew up on the side of this mountain? I did it again. If you think that surface tension is a lot easier here than you remember, you're not wrong. I know that difficulty doesn't affect enemy count in Half-Life, but I still had to check and yeah, I'm still playing on hard. The enemy count is just a lot smaller here, possibly for balancing reasons or even system limitations. It really makes the HECU feel smaller. And for all the chapters that they're in charge, the lack of former ROTC kids to stuff into lockers is gonna be consistent throughout the rest of them. And this bleeds over to the Zen Grunts too for when they take charge. Lots of arenas feel like their enemy counts have been drastically reduced, which could be a result of the PlayStation 2 just not being able to handle that original enemy count. Look at this guy, he was promised the whole damn platoon and now his life is flashing before his eyes. So many lockers, so many swirlies, so little time. Only a handful of Zen Grunts charge you down after blasting this hangar door open, compared to the absurd amount of them that bum rush you from before. And that Vortigon on the catwalk that's right after just <laughs> doesn't show up. Hey Trav guy, it's great that you remember that you could get the revolver and blast pit, but did you also know that you could Shoot the mines. The armory that this Barney opens up for us begins in a much smaller hallway and instead turns to the left rather than straight ahead. This is another really innocuous change, but I think that this was the result of trying to reduce the map size, trying to cut as few corners as possible. It's a nitpick that only insane people like myself would care enough to point out, let alone notice. The snark nests here look real gross here, which is delightfully revolting compared to whatever the fuck their nests were supposed to be in the original. It's so much harder for me to kill these a little red bastards. Not because they're any different here, but a skill issue. Oh, what? They took away the jank as fuck alien turret. And they took away Gordon's weird as fuck little idle animation with the glue gun where he awkwardly jiggles the handle when you hold down the alt fire. I keep pressing the secondary fire button, but Randy's committing me to chastity against my will. Lambda Core was a big test of my patience here, and it really took me back to those days of playing this game for the first time as a kid. A time back when normal difficulty was too tough for me, and I safe scummed every couple steps back onto easy. We've come a long way, I'd like to think. Even after 
after I beat this sequence, the scientist still died, but the portal was open and left me enough time to jump in. Good thing I'm getting kidnapped after I'm done in Zen. I'd hate to see what this place turns into after that portal went haywire. Alright, I guess it doesn't matter. This place gets nuked anyway. You must go! To my surprise, Zen is mostly untouched, both the chapter of the same name and the final four chapters of the game, or at least the level geometry is. The Gone Arc felt noticeably weaker, but this could have been because of the lock-on, and the first map of Interloper was virtually empty when it came to enemies. I didn't run into any Zen forces until I got to the top of this pillar and got assaulted by some controllers, which, yeah, were a pain in the ass, but that's my fault for running so low on ammo. Even inside the factory, this tight egg hull way has significantly fewer zen grunts than before. I know I could spawn more by cracking open some of these barrels, but there's usually more resistance before we have to crack some eggs. And these spinning elevators? Way slower and more manageable than it was before. I'm almost wondering if they were tied to the frame rate in some way. Also, I got 360 no scoped by a Vortigod. I can't even be mad at that. The Nihilanth, though, is practically identical, for better and mostly for the worst. You can still block his green portals with hive hand projectiles and hide behind the pillar next to this healing pond. It's the exact same boss fight as it is on PC, except I'm doing it with a controller, so I'm naturally a lot worse at it. I still beat him by blasting his funny head pyramid with my speaker peeking shotgun. Hey Randy, you forgot to set the explosion gifts opacity to screen. It's a rookie mistake, I know, but you'll you'll get it next time. Oh, what's that? What do you mean Gabe made the same mistake? Gordon Freeman in the flesh. Whoa, G-Man, you've uh I get that I have a widow's peak, but I don't think your hairline is supposed to look like a jiggling ass. Dude could really use some intergalactic finasteride. It's time to choose. I'm not fond of time. Well, it looks like we won't be working together. No regrets, Mr. Freeman. Oh uh, hell nah, G-Man sent us to the Zen Grunt dance party without any refreshments. Is that controller hitting the gritty? You know what would make me hit the gritty is if you subscribed to the video and even donated to me on Patreon to get benefits like joining the Discord server. You even get your name read out loud, joining people like Greg, Scott Debu, Paltham, Shadesman, CJ Deluxe, Uncleys, Lots of Caps, Catgirl Sky, Thickless Mage, SSG Meathook, Shine Spark, Dante Bishop, Nickel, EMC Mend, Dragon XRD, Silk, Super Mango Man, I am the Pokemon Master, Otaku Day, Carnitas, Pixel Pocket, Slim Jims, Media Ben, EMT Neutrino, and Chef Kilo. Thank you for your support, and I'll see you next time.